Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T. If you like all things true crime, if you like it delivered in a peaceful, tranquil manner, if you like it clear and concise without drama, then I highly recommend you subscribe. And if you like what you hear, please smash the like button. It's a free way you can help. And now, without further ado, Let's dig in. JLR Investigates scored an interview last night with one of the Proudfoot's neighbors, a lady who is named Bobby. Bobby said that she lives at the top of the hill on Kellen, so it's either this house or this one. I'm going to talk about what Bobby said last night, but first I want to clear up a few things, so let's start with my clarifications. Let's talk about those cease and desist letters. Sebastian Rogers' father, Seth, said he sent six cease and desist letters to YouTubers in Tennessee. Well, one of the six is not a YouTuber. It's Chloe, the private investigator. And in my opinion, Seth should not have sent such a letter to her. She's been searching since day one and she's been doing it free of charge. She's also a legitimate private investigator, and it's unfair that she's been attacked. If anything, she should be sending a cease and desist letter because her reputation at this point is on the line. A lot of people are attacking Seth for all of this. Here's my take. Seth is no doubt a reactionary person. When his feathers are ruffled, He seems to lash out verbally. In my opinion, he should take a beat before he does anything when he's mad. There's a difference between being frank and straightforward and being an over-the-top reactionary person. The first is a good thing. Being frank, that's a good thing. Being reactionary usually gets you into hot water where you're the one who suffers not the person you reacted to, and I speak from experience on this one. It seems to be always better if you cool down from your anger before you contact the person and before you lash out. Usually, if you just react, you say a lot of bad things that you can't retract. So that's my advice to Seth. But I also want to point out that we've watched Seth go from confidence on day one of Sebastian being missing. He seemed very upbeat and he seemed pretty certain that Sebastian would be found. But over the three months, we've watched Seth have to grapple with the possibility that his son might not come home. And very few people, thank God, know what that feels like. We're not in his shoes. We can't know just how tired he is, if he has panic attacks at night over his son's fate, if he's experiencing medical issues as a result of all the stress. Grief is also a multi-step process. Seth is caught in a nowhere land between hope and denial and despair and grief. Let's cut this man some slack. I offer slack to Seth because of this and because he has an alibi. Yes, he keeps saying he's a suspect, but only an innocent person would continually say that. I think he says it as a way to also express that Chris and Katie Proudfoot are also still suspects. So let's not twist him saying that he's a suspect into some new off-the-wall conspiracy theories. The dude was at work, He was captured on camera there. If we find out that Seth was involved in Sebastian's disappearance, I will literally eat my shirt. Do they make gummy bear shirts? And by the way, I've covered this case extensively and I haven't received a cease and desist letter. I also don't call Sebastian names like a predator. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say. So let's get back to Bobby. According to Bobby, someone other than the Proudfoots initially posted on the neighborhood Facebook page about Sebastian being missing. The neighbor who posted had noticed all the police presence in the neighborhood and asked if anyone knew what was going on. 
after that post, Katie Proudfoot left a brief two-sentence post saying that Sebastian was missing. I think Bobby said she listed how tall he is and she said, please keep an eye out for him. And after Katie's post, Chris Proudfoot posted something even briefer akin to, yeah, my son's missing. It sounds like the neighborhood was just getting ready to start the day when all these squad cars showed up. Now, Bobby jumped to 8.30. She said that her neighbor called her and the neighbor said that they went running out of their house to help with the search once they saw Seth, Katie, and Kathy Bowersox in the Proudfoot's front yard. This is the first time I'm hearing that Seth arrived at the Proudfoot home on Monday, February 26, before Chris Proudfoot showed up from his three-plus-hour drive home from Nashville. The neighbor said this was sometime between 8.20 and 8.30 a.m. So let's now review the timeline based on Bobby's new information. We know that Katie Proudfoot said that she went to wake up Sebastian for school at 6 a.m. and he wasn't there. Katie has said that she then called her husband, Chris Proudfoot. She ran around the house frantically looking for Sebastian. Sometime after speaking to Chris, Katie gets in her vehicle and she drives to the nearby Beach High School. That is a three minute drive. And Katie, according to Bobby, via another neighbor who told her, so secondhand information, Katie was back home between 6.15 and 6.30. Regardless of the exact time, Katie was home rather quickly after this search. At 6.33 a.m., Chris Proudfoot calls the sheriff's office on a three-way call with Katie. At 6.39 a.m., the police dispatcher makes an announcement over the radio that Sebastian Rogers is missing. But according to the dispatcher, at 6.40 a.m., Katie Proudfoot was still driving around looking for Sebastian. So there's a disconnect between the timeline Bobby provided on Katie's search and what the dispatcher said. According to Bobby, a neighbor told her that Katie Proudfoot ran out of the Proudfoot home at 7 a.m. I'm wondering if she did that to greet the police. And we know from the police radio chatter that at 7.45 a.m., footprints were seen in the mud at a retention pond nearby in the construction zone. And again, another of Bobby's neighbors told her that at 8.30 a.m., the neighbor saw Seth, Katie, and Kathy Bowersox in the Proudfoot's front yard. And again, I find it surprising that Seth was already at the Proudfoot home at 8.30 a.m., and Chris Proudfoot was not yet home. By the way, Bobby questioned Katie Proudfoot's logic in thinking that Sebastian might have walked to the school all by himself. Bobby said, why would he do that when he's never done it before? And why would he go there barefoot? And I have to agree with Bobby. Katie's logic seems illogical. According to Bobby, Sebastian normally rode the bus to school but he didn't ride the bus for special needs children. Instead, he rode with the, I guess we'll say, non-special needs kids. Bobby received this information from another neighbor, so again, it's secondhand. A lot of what Bobby said was, in fact, secondhand information from other neighbors. According to Bobby, the police then went to all the neighbors to ask them to look for Sebastian, and the drones were soon up and it became a chaotic scene. Bobby did not see Seth or Katie Proudfoot out looking. They did not leave the property. But again, Seth has said in previous interviews that the cops told them not to go out on foot looking for Sebastian. That's why Seth later went in his truck because they didn't tell him he couldn't drive around looking for his son. By the way, Bobby said her sons helped search all day Monday and Tuesday, and the neighborhood had a private vigil for Sebastian the day after he vanished. 
So it was Tuesday night. And according to Bobby, in the neighborhood, there are two to three sets of neighbors who have connections to law enforcement. And some of them came to the vigil. Now, Chris and Katie did not attend the vigil and neither did Seth. Chris and Katie sent some people who said they were an aunt and an uncle. Now, Seth was maybe back at his house by that hour because it was at night. We know that Seth has said that he did not spend the night at the Proudfoot's home. Also, I think we don't want to fault the parents for not wanting to attend an initial vigil when their emotions may have still been very raw. Bobby said the Proudfoots moved into the neighborhood a year and a half ago and that they tend to stick to themselves. But per Bobby, everyone in the neighborhood tends to be a little bit like that. They know each other, but maybe not well, and they mostly mind their own business. One thing Bobby said was that Seth spent the night at the Proudfoots home. But again, that is not what Seth said. And I tend to agree with what Seth said because it doesn't sound like he would be comfortable spending the night in the Proudfoot home. And it seems doubtful that he would have been invited to do so. Bobby also talked about the scent dogs and she said that they did not pick up a scent from the Proudfoot home. That is not what other people have said. I could swear it was Chris Proudfoot who said, Three scent dogs picked up Sebastian's scent from the home and followed the same track down to the retention pond. According to Bobby, that is not true. And she said her sons were there helping with the search, so they saw it all go down in real time. The only thing that her sons saw happen was that one of the dogs went to one of the retention ponds and jumped in it. And according to her children, the handler of that dog said that his pup has never done that before, meaning he's never jumped in the water before. According to Bobby, they drained the pond twice and didn't see anything. By the way, Bobby said that all of the following were helping with the search from the get-go the Sumner County Law Enforcement, the Hendersonville PD, state troopers, National Guard, drones, three sets of canines, and helicopters. So once again, I say this was a very extensive search in that five mile radius. Now let's talk about those mysterious lights that were captured on a security camera at around 3.10 a.m. Both law enforcement and Seth and Chris Proudfoot have said that those lights were from trash trucks. However, according to Bobby, the neighborhood trash always gets picked up between 5.15 a.m. and 5.30 a.m. on Mondays. So that's a lot later than those mysterious lights that were captured. Bobby said the trash guys probably show up in the neighborhood around 5 a.m. to begin their pickups. The garbage goes to Nashville unless the landfill is full. If it's full, the garbage goes to a landfill in Gallatin. The dumpster in the construction zone goes to Kentucky, and we already knew that part. Bobby said she was told law enforcement also checked landfills in Nashville and Gallatin as well for Sebastian. To me, that would seem to indicate that they were suspicious that perhaps Chris Proudfoot may have allegedly been involved in dumping the body. According to Bobby, two separate flashlights were seen on that neighbor's camera walking between the yards, which apparently the trash truck people never do. The trash is always at the curb, they never come out of the truck. That would only happen if, say, there was an elderly couple that needed help. So Bobby doesn't believe the 3 10 a.m. lights are from the trash trucks. In fact, she seems pretty sure of it. She also said that there was an unidentified car that backed up from Kellen Lane onto Stafford Court, where it sat for three to five minutes right around this same time, 3.10 a.m., it then left. About two hours later, the actual trash truck showed up. So going back to the whole light thing, 
I was told that there was an unidentified car sitting on my street facing the entrance um, somewhere around 3.30 or so. And then that, and then the light, the flashlights were actually seen on the neighbor's camera, two separate flashlights walking in between the yards, which the trash truck does not do. They don't need to. All of the trash is at the curb. They have never, ever gone. Matter of fact, when you sign up for services, they tell you in the email the rules and regulations. If your, your trash is not by the curb, they don't take it. Unless, you know, you're an elderly person, you ask them if your trash is like in the front of your house and you ask them, they'll come and get it like that, but they won't come around the back or in between houses. That's bull monarchy. That is not so, how that works. No track. You don't, you don't believe that that three, those three ten a.m. lights were uh, around three ten after three a.m. were trash truck lights. Not only do I not believe it, but the neighbor that has the actual footage swore up and down that there are two different circumstances. There was the car with the lights coming towards the car. The car backed up on Kellen and left. And then about two-ish hours, hour and a half, hour 42 something, they're, they're, like she said, the ta- time stamp on the video is not working. It is stuck. She said, but you can tell because it's pitch black dark in the middle of the night when the car comes down the street, turns on to Stafford, sits there for about three to five minutes. The flashlights are coming from two different directions in between the yards. They do whatever they're doing around the car. The car backs up Kellen and leaves from Stafford. I'm sorry, backs up Kellen and leaves. And then two or so hours later, as the sun is just beginning to come up, you can see the trash truck. And she said, but the trash truck goes past her driveway. She said, you can see the trash truck and the lights and the back of the truck go past her driveway, go up the hill, do its business, turn around, come back down. And then within a few minutes later, the the sun is coming up. And then you can see Katie's car leave, Katie's car coming back. And then you can see all the police come in. She said, it's very obvious. Okay, so why would this lady go on camera, show her face? I don't know if that's her actual name, Bobby. Why would she go on camera and tell this story about this footage? This makes me believe that what she's saying is true. But then the question is, why is law enforcement claiming that those were trash trucks? And why did Seth seem to believe that those were trash trucks? And why did Chris Proudfoot say that they were trash trucks. Well, I can guess why Chris Proudfoot would say that. Just saying. None of it makes sense. What makes sense is that they were flashlights. That's the only way you can explain them being between the houses. And if those flashlights went anywhere near that car that was parked there, then it would seem that this is how perhaps Sebastian was removed from the house and possibly driven away. Now the lady, Bobby, said it was an unidentified car, so it sounds like they could not see the license plate. If all of this is captured on footage and the police have it, why do they keep saying there's no evidence of foul play? To me, this would be strong evidence of foul play. Does this mean that law enforcement is keeping information to themselves? That perhaps they are lying as they do their investigation? Or is it true that the Bauer Sox have connections to local law enforcement and local law enforcement is allegedly helping to cover up a crime? Allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. As they say, something doesn't smell right. I have to say that 310 hour seems like it would be a very good time for something to go down if someone needed to remove something from the home that they didn't want anyone else to see. We know it was very dark out there at the time. I always say that bad things happen between, let's say, 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. That seems to be the witching hour when people assume everyone's asleep and nobody's going to see anything. Now, JLR also brought up the supposed footage of Sebastian taking out the trash. Bobby said the neighbors captured that 
on their ring camera, and the neighbor said that the only thing you can see is a silhouette. It's impossible to see who exactly took the trash out. And that would be supported by what Seth has said about that footage. He said he saw it, but he could not tell if that was Sebastian. To me, this is another sign that what Bobby is telling us is true. It's being corroborated by Seth Rogers, and other stories that we've heard. Bobby also said that there's no physical proof of Sebastian being at the Proudfoot home after dinner at the Texas Roadhouse. She said a camera did pick up Katie's car coming back home, but because she parks in the garage, no one could tell if Sebastian got out. The neighbor also said that it was very dark when Katie got home, and that it was perhaps 6 p.m. Well, she used the wording 6 p.m.-ish. A lot of people say that the cops in Tennessee tend to be corrupt. We've seen through Terry Lynn's searches that the police are reticent to come out when evidence or potential evidence, I should say, is out there and found. We've heard that a canine hit at a certain location and the police never came out and they never followed up on that hit. I'm sure there are some good cops out there and I'm sure there are some bad cops, just like there are good people and bad people anywhere, good YouTubers and bad YouTubers, you know what I'm saying? Bobby also said that she never saw any of the Proudfoots, the Bauer Socks, or even Seth searching around the neighborhood. Bobby then described a scary encounter she had with Chris Proudfoot on Thursday night that first week after Sebastian went missing. I'm going to play that part for you because it's pretty darn interesting and I think it shows once again what type of person Chris Proudfoot is. None of them ever look in our neighborhood where I'm at. I've never seen any of them walking around at all, period, ever. Seth, Chris, Katie, Bower socks, none of them ever. I never even met them. I had one encounter with with Chris one night, um, and after I mean I no, never saw him, never met him, nothing. The Chris encounter, you you mind sharing? I I think we talked about this offline a little bit. Yes, I'll okay. So I'll kind of share a little bit of that. Um, my this was the gosh, what day? What day was it? Thursday, I think it was. I think it was Thursday. That Thursday night. Um, now, mind you, our neighborhood is on pins and needles. Um, don't know what happened to this kid. Don't understand. Law enforcement's, you know, coming up and around. We've got every department that I didn't even know existed. Like I said, I didn't know, you know, we had a SWAT team. I didn't know we had, you know, drone footage. I didn't know we had any of this stuff. I mean, we're, a, you know, a small county. I didn't have no idea. Not a small county, but you know what I mean? Like, we're away from, like, the big crowd, you know, the, the city. Um, never had any issues. So, I didn't even know that any of this stuff has existed. Um so we're all kind of on pins and needles and so anything weird let me go back a little bit and say the night before this this is the reason why this happened the night before this my i had i had went to work that night i think i did something i wasn't home for some reason my son was on our back deck now our back deck faces the construction the top the back of the construction and so he was on the back deck talking to somebody and he looks out and he says well that's really weird and she said what and he said look at the light out there and there was a flashlight it was kind of a dim flashlight but you could see it because it's pit block dark um and he said why is there a flashlight over there it was one single flashlight and it was like walking in the back um kind of over in the back of the woods area and it like walked around stopped walked around a little bit stopped and then just disappeared in the back of the woods and so he called me and he's like, what do I do? And I said, you need to call law enforcement, like call the number. We had a flyer, had, you know, one of those flyers. And I was like, you need to call the TBI and tell them and figure out what to do with that. He did. And nothing, no phone call back. No, no, nothing. nothing. Just, okay. Thanks for the letter. I'm like, okay, that's awfully weird. I mean, you would think that they would come check that out or call you back and ask you. Yeah. Follow-ups. Nothing. No, they didn't even call him back to ask him like, exactly where are you? You know, what did you see? Nothing. Nobody ever followed up or nothing. And so he was like, that's really weird. And I was like, yeah, that is weird. I mean, with a missing kid, you would think they would be coming flying up here to figure out who that was. So it was the following night. So now, of course, we're all like, you know, even more in pins and it was like, is people just going to just start walking around our neighborhood in the middle of the night? Like they're pitch black dark in the night. 
And so uh, my, he was coming home. We were all at home and still looking around and talking to neighbors and figuring out, like, what the heck is going on. And he comes home and walks in the door and is like, Mom, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, now what? And he said, there was there's two people, a real tall, skinny guy and a real small, it looks like a girl maybe, that is walking up our street. Now, we do have families that will come out and walk their dogs at night before they go to bed. But they had no dog with them, no nothing. And the strangest part about this was this guy was wearing dark, black, wide, like, ski goggles. You've been in my neighborhood. It is, you can't see your hand in front of your face. It is so dark at night. It was 9 o'clock at night. Why is somebody walking with these big black goggles? How can they even see? Well, with everything going on, I'm thinking, okay, that's very suspicious. I gotta check on that. Yes, I could have called law enforcement, and that's what was said. You should have called law enforcement. However, I didn't want to call law enforcement on my own neighbor. If it was a neighbor out walking around, I didn't want to be rude and call law enforcement on my neighbor. So I told my son, I said, you know what, let's go. He's got a Jeep that's got a bunch of lights on it. And I said, let's drive down there and, and, and turn your lights on and see. If you can see somebody out there walking, I said, I'll call law enforcement and let them know. And then we'll just turn around and go back home. I wasn't going to follow them. I just wanted to see if I could find them. So we're driving down my road. We turn up Stafford because we didn't couldn't find them. I'm like, well, maybe they went up Stafford. We went up Stafford. Now my son's Jeep is loud. Um, and so I, but I didn't even think about it. I was more focused on who this person was. So I, he drives up Stafford and he says to me, hey, while we're up here, where's Sebastian's house? And I'm like, oh, uh, we just passed it. So he turns around. And goes back down, and we're going slowly because I was trying to point out Sebastian's house. And so I pointed it out, and he's like, oh, okay. And so we drive back around, and we're driving back down to the other side of the neighborhood, to another cul-de-sac, and he said, wait a minute. Didn't you say that this other neighbor has a ring camera? And I said, yes, and she's the one that saw the silhouette in the window and the lights in the house go on and off and whatever. She's like, but that doesn't make any sense because if that house is, is located here, how can she have seen over here? And I'm like, okay, back, go back up the street and I'll show you. So we went back up the street to show him where that house was versus this and all the whole thing. And as we were coming back up, we kind of stopped. Now this is my neighborhood. I'm not yeah. a suspicious person. This is my neighborhood. I should be able to do whatever I want to. Right? So I stopped or he stops a little bit. I'm pointing that house out and we drive out and I said, Sean, I said, honey, we got to go home. And he's like, why? And I said, because somebody's standing at their front door. He was like, oh crap. And so, and I did not, God honest truth. I never meant to upset anybody. It was truly just me trying to figure out what's going on. Never meant to upset anybody. Turn around Stafford. I'm coming back down and Chris is st- now, mind you, I've never met this man. Never seen him before. I wouldn't even know who he is. Matter of fact, I thought he was law enforcement. Stands in the middle of the street and puts his hand out and stops. Just like this. And I was like, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh crap. Oh crap. Oh crap. Oh crap. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking it's law enforcement. I'm like, oh crap. We're about to get in trouble because they're going to think that we're looking for this kid or something. So right on the window and he comes around and he stands there just like this. He's like, what are you doing out here? And I'm like, holy crap. I said, I said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. We're just, we were looking for, and I told him what happened and told him the whole story. And he was like, why wouldn't you just call law enforcement? I said, cause I don't want to call law enforcement on a neighbor. If they're out walking around, that's kind of rude. And he's like, well, you have no business driving around here and started telling me in a very intimidating, very strong voice, I guess you would say big, tough, you know, he's a big guy, you know, kind of thing. You know that that my son is missing, and and they've got police all around here looking. I said, yeah, no kidding. I know. I'm aware. I've been talking to him. Trust me. I know. I get it. And then he said, there's a there's a uh, police. What do you um the the heat sensor mobile unit things? You know what I'm talking about that that can detect heat sensor and stuff. Well, they had one of those up in the top, hoping that if he came home, it would alert law enforcement that there was somebody walking around. Which I don't get that because you've got families that are walking dogs anyway. So, I, anyway, so I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I kept apologizing to him and he got really upset and, you know, kind of said some things. And I was just trying to calm him down and I'm, I'm, I apologize. And my son's girlfriend was in the back and he, she thought that if she rolled the window down and said, 
I am such and such, and I go to your son's school, that he would calm down. Even though I said, hey, I'm your neighbor. I live up there. Everything's fine. I'm sorry I didn't mean to bother you. I thought even me telling him I was his neighbor would calm him down. It's like he just glossed right over that. He didn't care. So she says, I'm such and such, and I go to school with your son. And he stops mid-sentence to me and said, oh, and got, like, stopped, looked at her and said, your name? And he, she said, yes, sir. Like, how do you know? She only gave him her first name. And he said the whole thing. And she was like, how do you know my name? And I was like, what the crap? I looked at my son. I said, we need to go. You just, we just need to go. We just need to go. And I'm like, I'm going to call the police because this is getting, I don't know. I don't understand. I just, I wish you could have, I can't describe his body language was just very It strong. wasn't helpful for that people were out there looking for his son or thinking it was more like I, I'm trying to stop. Get off my street. Get off my street. Get out of here. Get off my street. Go home. Leave me alone. Get away from us. But he told her that so you're the girl that runs this Facebook group and this not that or I'm going to demand you take that off. You get your phone. And he said, where are your parents? And she said, at my house. And he said, well, I'm going to find out where you live and I'm going to come knock on their door and we're going to have a conversation. And he, she said, okay, good luck with that. And I was like, you know what? Look, we don't want to, you know, cause any issues and whatever. I try to give him grace, don't know the man from nowhere, and I just kept t- saying, you know, he's upset. His son's missing. He's really upset. He's very defensive. Maybe that's just all that what it was. Now that I've seen some of his YouTube videos, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. What right does Chris Proudfoot have to do that to his neighbor who has every right to get in their car and go check out something that looks suspicious? For all the times he said that he's just trying to be a good husband and protect his wife, that woman is somebody else's wife. What right do you have to come down, stop in front of her car, make her stop, and then you basically bully her? You also bully the young girl in the back seat. Last time I checked, you are not a sheriff and you do not own Stafford Court. And what you did to this lady and her son and the girl in the back seat was terrifying to them. Once again, we're hearing a story about Chris Proudfoot being a bully, liking to take his power and hold it over people. You know, just like he seemed to enjoy punishing Sebastian from all the stories he tells about it. You know, punishment, calling people out, acting like he's the authority on everything. That is Chris Proudfoot's MO. We've seen it time and time again when he shows up on these live panels. So again, this is another voice, Bobby, telling us about Chris Proudfoot's character, his personality, she also said that the Proudfoots kept to themselves. They never really came out. Sebastian did not play with the other kids in the neighborhood. They'd only see him out there once in a while, maybe if the dogs got out. You know, they say that abusive partners typically try to put their partners in isolated locations and they separate them from their family and they try to keep other people away. Could that be part of what we're seeing here? Those were my main takeaways from Bobby. So I will leave you with that. Allow it to percolate. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Like, share, subscribe, and I'll see you next time on Bed Crime Stories. Bastion left his home barefoot and with a flashlight sometime overnight. Since his disappearance, authorities have reviewed security video from homes in the neighborhood looking for clues. We have had several clips that have come in. And this one is getting the most attention, showing signs of activity around Sebastian's home the night he disappeared. You see, two light sources, which we've circled to help you follow. For point of reference, the security camera was pointed toward the back of Sebastian's home in a common area. In the video, you see subject one with a light source in the lower right-hand corner. Then you see subject two briefly appear and move toward the first before that light source is covered or obscured by bushes. Subject one, a few seconds later, then moves out of frame. Then subject two reappears and follows subject one off screen. 
It's a short time later, and it's very vague, but then you see one of the subjects moving quickly back through the common area, and that is it.